All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today for another Mass Medic webinar. Today we're talking about the role of digital medical technology in empowering patients to take control of their health. And I'm pleased to present this webinar today from Triple Ring Technologies. If you haven't met me, I'm Anna King, a marketing coordinator at MassMedic. And if you're not familiar with our organization, we're a membership-based trade association in the medical device industry. And we work to promote our ecosystem in New England through connection, education, events like this, advocacy, and awareness. I do have a quick housekeeping note before I turn it over to our presenters. This webinar is being recorded, so all registrants will receive the recording after the presentation. And we're also allocating some time for a Q&A, so please make sure to put your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. And now I'm pleased to turn it over to Ryan McGinnis from Triple Ring Technologies. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Anna, and uh, thanks to Mass Medic for uh, hosting us today. Um, we have a very exciting panel uh, organized by Coastal Group. Um, my name is Ryan McGinnis. I'm a commercial general manager at Triple Ring Technologies. At Triple Ring, we stand shoulder to shoulder with innovators and entrepreneurs to solve hard problems, to uh, launch breakthrough products, and to start companies. Uh, we are a big group of R&D engineers and scientists who build complex systems for clients. Um, our headquarters are in Silicon Valley, where I am today, but we have a fantastic office in downtown Boston and South End. Um, and um, I would love to chat with anybody if you um, have questions about the kinds of stuff that we do. Um, so um, as I mentioned, I'm quite excited about this panel and this topic. Um, we'll be talking about digital health and the ways in which uh, digital health technologies will uh, promote access, better access and better care for large populations. And I'm going to go ahead and, and walk through the uh, panel today and let folks introduce themselves and we'll jump into some uh, to the discussion shortly thereafter. So I would love to start with uh, Anna Finley, please go ahead and introduce yourself. Thank you, and thank you for having me. My name is Anna Finley, and excuse me, I'm a senior global product manager at Philips Healthcare. I'm here in our beautiful office in Cambridge, and I'm focused on new digital services in the ultrasound business. And over the course of my career, I've worked in digital innovation and healthcare and informatics, and even at a wearable startup. So companies big and small developing and implementing new digital health technologies that help make healthcare more convenient and connected and more better. So I'm looking forward to our conversation today. And thanks again. Yeah, thank you very much. <clears throat> and then Alan Raby, please uh, introduce yourself. Yeah, uh, good morning from uh, San Francisco. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here speaking with everyone today. Uh, as Ryan mentioned, my name is Alan Raby, and uh, I'm the founder of CareMates. And uh, CareMates is a uh, digital care company for older adults. We have offices here in San Francisco, and as well as in uh, Tokyo, Japan. I'm a uh, serial uh, entrepreneur and uh, entrepreneur, uh, and I've worked with um, insure tech and um, medical companies, um, you know, primarily in the United States, uh, up in Canada, as well as Japan. And I look forward to today's conversation. Great. Thanks a lot, Alan. And then Laura Marsden, please introduce yourself. Hi, Laura Marsden. Um, I have about 25 years in, in med device and really took a strong focus in usability systems and just uh, being able to create value. Um, you know, really, really found myself in a position where I really wanted to design what I needed um, as the mom of a critically ill kid with chronic illness, um, had been working with Mass General and Improved Care Now and really started looking around and thinking, you know, we have all these disparate sources of information, whether it's wearables or, you know, the lab tests that I'm, I'm getting back every month and then doctor's visits. And, you know, I have this child who I watch fall off the cliff over and over again. You know, how can I put together a solution that would really answer the problems that we had, um, you know, as patients, caregivers, and then also saw my you know, son's caregivers struggling to have the appropriate information in a centralized place. So 
um, have been absolutely fortunate to work with an incredible team and leadership at Jabel Healthcare to design and build um, our healthcare platform. And, um, you know, going through that whole certification development of a device digital thread. So um, thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to the uh, conversation. Yeah, thank you as well. Um, so this is great. So that you can uh, tell that this panel has deep, deep experience and uh, a lot of history in a technology space uh, and market that's actually relatively young for med device. And we'll get into some of that um, as well. So um, just as a, some, some calibration or to get an idea of the, the size of what we're talking about here, um, the digital health market is expected to be half a billion, sorry, 500 billion um, dollars in revenue by 2027. Uh, and it's growing as the fastest of any uh, sub-segment in med device and healthcare. Uh, so this is a big deal. Uh, and it's um, coming at us fast, and I'm not terribly sure that we're prepared for it. Um, so we're going to jump into the conversation. <clears throat> and um, as Anna King mentioned, uh, we would be happy to take questions along the way. And certainly you're setting some time aside at the back end of the, of the conversation. So I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, start with you, Anna Finley. Um, you've been operating it at the intersection of digital technology and healthcare for pretty much your entire career. And Philips is, is very well known as a leader in the digital transformation of our industry. So can you describe Philips' approach to digital health and some of the programs that you have underway? Yeah, thank you. So at Philips, we have a mission to improve the lives of 2.5 billion people per year by 2030. And that's including 400 million in underserved areas. So we see also that the future of healthcare delivery is meeting patients where they are. And to get there, we need to also help healthcare IT to be able to adapt and extend to the various care settings. So beyond the hospital, outpatient centers, you know, even to the home. So how are we doing that? Um, an example in ultrasound is our Lumify device. So this is a very portable ultra mobile ultrasound system, which is like a scaled down ultrasound that plugs into your iPhone or mobile phone or tablet. And with the tele ultrasound solution that we have, you're able to connect with experts across town or across the world. And this is helping to expand access to care. So for patients who are in rural or underserved areas, you have access to, so the care providers are with the patient and can directly call or collaborate with expert specialists that may be in the big city that's, you know, in the big medical center 200 miles away. And besides that extra expert support for the person who's taking the images on the ultrasound, it also enables that doctor to be right there in the room with the patient as well. So you can discuss the findings and have kind of a reassuring conversation. So there's many examples across Philips, but all kind of, I think, with the aim for this healthcare delivery to be more accessible and convenient and connected. And then also, of course, with the positive health outcomes at the heart of everything. So, hmm, hmm. Yeah, yeah, that brings up a few different questions I'll get to in a bit. Um, and then Alan, uh, CareMates can be thought of as an age tech platform, right? Um, and, you know, we've spoken quite a bit about the world's aging population as a slow rolling crisis um, with major impacts, not just on healthcare, but on societies more broadly. And can you tell us a bit about um, CareMates and how age tech overlaps with healthcare and empowers users or end users or people to, to manage their health? over the long haul. Yeah, sure. And just before I get into uh, an overview of CareMates, I just want to give people an overview of uh, what we call a silver tsunami uh, that's upon us right now. So the world's actually aging and uh, a lot of people really aren't tracking that uh, that closely. So just to put this into context from a U.S. marketplace perspective, so every day in the U.S. alone, 10,000 people turn over 65. That's daily. 
2021, there was 55.8 million people in the U.S. who were over 65. And by 2030, that number is going to rise to 71 million. So that's a 27% increase in the next six and a half years. By 2030, which is you know roughly seven years away, there's a need for 1.3 million jobs in uh, home health care are required. So when you think about when you do the math behind that, you take 1.3 million, you divide it by roughly seven years, um, it's really impossible to create that many people for the market. But that just gives you an idea of what's happening in the U.S. Just a one little quick data point. If you look at this globally in China, their demographics went upside down last year. There's 167 million people over the age of 65 in China. So coming back to the United States, senior households, which are people age 65 and above, that is actually the fastest growing uh, household segment in the United States. So it's growing about by a million a year right now. So when you look at this from a market perspective, what they call aging in place just for home-based healthcare in the United States in 2019, it is actually a $151 billion market. So it's a pretty big market. And we'll flip over and we'll just talk about Japan just for a data point. So the home care market in Japan is bigger than consumer electronics and mm. automotive combined. Mm. So that gives you an idea of how big it is. Because you think about Toyota, Honda, Mazda, Sony, Panasonic, that home healthcare market is bigger than their two markets combined. So when we were looking at this silver tsunami that's upon us, um, there's only a couple ways to solve it. You bring more immigrants in um, who have a background in that, which is very hard to do when you start looking at the, the gap, or you start sharing resources and automating tasks. So what CareMates really is, it's a um, it's a shared economy platform or a digital care platform for older adults. It consists of five main pillars. So companion care services. So if you need someone to pick you up and drop you off to the hospital to come in and make meals for you or to take you out and go walks, that's companion care. Lifestyle and wellness. So people want to remain healthy so you can do different activities, exercise activities financial planning services. And then this is where you actually start seeing the crossover into uh, the med tech world is digital therapeutics and telehealth. So one of the first things we actually put onto our platform, um, we have uh, video chat services. We've actually included as the base functionality. We could build telehealth on top of that. So what you'll see in COVID um, actually drove a lot of this home is people would prefer to age in place and then if they can actually get telehealth services in the comfort of their home, that's the way to go as opposed to jumping into a car if they have mobility issues and driving off to a doctor and coming back. So when you actually take a look at, you know, the services that I define to people, the last four, when you take a look at aging, people have different aging journeys. So when you start looking at, you know, people in the U.S., they tend to retire at the age of 65. And then as they get older, their services are different what they require. So we offer financial planning services, lifestyle and wellness that tends to cater to younger demographics. And then as people get older or they start running into challenges, then you start getting into things such as companion care. The telehealth will be there for anyone who actually needs it as well. So as you can see, there's actually a confluence going on right now between you know, healthcare and age tech. And when you think about it from a Venn diagram perspective, these things actually in the middle, you start seeing age tech coming in, but it touches on multiple things. Uh, the other thing we'll actually include into our platform is for dementia. Um, there is unfortunately no cure for dementia right now. So once you actually uh, succumb to that disease, you pass away and it costs about $350,000 just to care for someone once they got dementia. So how do you start applying digital therapeutics to help prevent dementia and other diseases? Yeah, yeah. And fascinating. The, 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 the holistic approach uh, that we need to take, uh, but then also the, the way uh, digital enables that is, is, is really very cool. Um, so Laura, uh, Jabel occupies a very unique position in the med device and healthcare industries. Um, and as a top tier contract manufacturer, can you give us your perspective on the evolution of digital healthcare and, and some of the exciting things that are going on at your group and in your team? These days. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, just being a contract manufacturer and serving so many, you know, blue chip uh, med device companies, 
I think it's been a real shift for us to think about, you know, the focus isn't so much on the device, that that value is really in what insights, what actionable insights the data from those devices can provide. And, you know, to be honest, it can be a really heavy lift, um, you know, even for our larger uh our, our larger uh, customers. So, you know, they don't really often have the full infrastructure to manage and use the data from connected devices. So we were seeing a lot of customers come in wanting to enter the connected market and realizing that, uh, you know, regulated platform is going to be a really heavy lift. Um, in addition, you know, I think we've seen a lot of connecting disparate devices and, um, you know, thinking that that was going to provide enough information. It provides, you know, interesting information. A lot of times you're, you're gathering one data set, but I think until you really have that contextual data that interoperability can provide and ensuring you have, you know, the correct biometrics that are going to give you that contextual understanding, you know, for example, you might receive an injection of a drug. And um, if you're wearing a wearable, you know, that heart rate might be showing it, it's going up, right? But what's really going on? Are they out for a run or are they having a drug reaction? Um, you know, really being able to have that contextual information come to the decision maker or that one centralized point to really understand what's going on is, is key. And I think in healthcare in general, we're just really seeing an inflection point. Um, you know, we have so many patients, not enough bandwidth for clinicians. You know, I'm seeing appointments get pushed out for six months where, you know, just even a year ago, it was maybe, you know, two, three months, which was bad enough. Um, so, you know, if you are got a digital solution, right, and you can't provide either some good actionable insights that are of value to that clinical team to make an informed decision in one place with one person, or you can't optimize that workflow and reduce cost and efficiencies by allowing, you know, um, you know, remote monitoring, whether it's at home or even in the hospital, you know, being able to go into a room and having a smart board, for example, with all the information about that patient. So you're not making errors, being able to voice to documentation to save, um, you know, clinicians from that overburden. Um, and I think also just really understanding what has to be true of the overall ecosystem for this to actually be realized. So we're at a really unique point, I feel like. Um, we're the only solution provider that really offers that full end-to-end -end development, being able to influence the connectivity and the appropriateness of the solution from the design of the actual device all the way through to the end solution. And being a contract manufacturer puts us in a unique point as well in terms of how can we actually serve our OEMs from that device digital thread that we have such a, a rich repository of data on, you know, what kind of, um, you know, life cycle management, supply chain, or post-market surveillance can you be providing, you know, on top of that, that device fleet management, the ability to pull in, um, you know, service providers to make sure that that equipment, if it's in a clinic or in a hospital, stays up and running. So I, I think we're really poised to answer some unique problems, which is exciting. Yeah, yeah, no, it's um, it's exciting, but there are plenty of challenges ahead. So um, thinking broadly, in my mind, the the healthcare industry is lagging in the full adoption of, of the digital revolution, essentially. I mean, and if I think about other big market segments or big industry industrial segments like finance, entertainment and retail, those are examples of, of big industries that have fully embraced digital strategies, right? Um, to the benefit of all. Um, and so I'm, I'm always puzzling over the reasons why healthcare finds it difficult to adopt digital strategies. And, and maybe, um, Anna, if you can jump in and start this off um, with some thoughts. Yeah, I, I think that's totally true about, you know, so many other industries, even regulated ones like banking and, you know, manufacturing, healthcare still seems to always be kind of behind behind the train. And I have heard many times before that, you know, that typical Silicon Valley disruptive tech mantra of move fast and break things, you know, that doesn't work so well in healthcare given the stakes, you know, human lives and well-being. 
So it makes sense that we have a very conservative industry, but I think that not all of the inertia, let's say, are really about legitimate concerns of our patient safety. Some of them are, but also I think part of it is just the huge end-to-end -end complexity. I mean, also there's a lot of stakeholders involved, like the regulators and standards bodies and insurers and payers and even you know, medical schools. So we need rules to guide data ownership and stewardship transparency. We have the GDPR and HIPAA, but kind of beyond that, I think there are uncharted territories like generate uh, like chat GPT and other AI that's kind of uncharted territory. And people should be able to understand kind of what their data is being used for and be able to make choices about it. And doctors also you know, with these new digital therapeutics people mentioned talking about, they need proof that, that that these things really do improve outcomes and, you know, they need treatment protocols on how to use them and get training. And then also the insurers and payers, you know, they crucially need to be the ones who are providing reimbursement and payment for these things. And so that end-to-end -end picture working smoothly, I think, until that happens, we're kind of delaying the big opportunities that we have, I think. And clearly, if we, if people, you know, the insurers is very beneficial for everyone in the whole world to be able to invest in prevention and proactive care mm -hmm. that really will benefit everybody in terms of both money and, of course, well-being and health. So, yeah, a lot yeah, of opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Alan, I, uh, Anna had mentioned a few different things that you've had to face as, as an entrepreneur with CareMates. <clears throat> I mean, a lot of us uh, put the blame for for adoption or slow adoption on the regulatory um, environment. I don't know that that's a, a the, the the main reason or not. I mean, it's certainly a hurdle, but we understand it well. Um, how has it been in your experience trying to push through a product like this? Yeah, let me <clears throat> talk about other things um, that are very relevant to this. Sure. One is actually. Uh, facing us right now, and Anna mentioned this. So if you take a look at Open OpenAI, ChatGPT, that is backed by Microsoft primarily. And the brilliance behind this is it's a startup. It was able to attract the right talent, compensate the right talent. It was done outside of the four walls of a big company. And at the same time, when it comes to risk mitigation, uh, if anything goes wrong, Microsoft could point the finger at OpenAPI and say, hey, it's their problem. But at the same time, it leverages all Microsoft's um, you know, resources they have. And I am actually a fintech entrepreneur. A lot of people don't know that. So the first time mobile banking was launched nationwide in North America, I did that. And how that got off the ground, that was a startup that was funded by Bank of America, Bank of Montreal, Citibank, and Wells Fargo. And it was done outside of the four walls of those big organizations. And we had attorneys who were part of that startup who were comfortable dealing with ambiguity and taking risk. And so that's what allowed mobile banking to get off the ground in the United States was a startup driven by four large companies. How generative AI is getting off the ground, it's a startup driven with Microsoft sitting in behind it, funding it. So when I hear all this stuff, people talking about regulatory this and that, I always tell them, try to find a large partner to work with, take it outside of the four walls of the company, innovate outside of that. And what we did within CareMates, our first market we went into was in Japan, and we literally were very fortunate. We had the, it's a shared economy platform. We had the two attorneys who brought a very popular shared economy platform from the US into Japan. They were my attorneys, they knew what they were doing. And they were comfortable dealing with ambiguity and risk, but they were on my team for about 12 months and we were doing, you know, daily, uh, you know, meetings with them and whatnot and statuses, but they helped us successfully navigate a highly conservative economy. Can you mention who those, those uh, companies were? You're not, uh, I can't, your lawyers came from. I, I cannot. Well, they're they actually they well, the good thing is they're not part of those companies. They yeah. own their own own very small boutique law firm, and they also consult for members of the Japanese diet. So they knew how to navigate the political system as well. But anytime you deal with a new new uh, emerging technology, be it mobile banking 23 years ago or be it you know generative AI, 
I always tell people, get it outside of the four walls of the monster and mm -hmm. try to do it that way. You can find the right people and you can move really quick. And if something goes south and things do go south, the parent just backs off and go, hey, we're just funding them, right? And Microsoft has done this quite brilliantly because if you compare, you know, ChatGPT to Bard right now, ChatGPT is running away from, but Google's kept everything internally. Yeah, yeah, interesting. And the reason I press you on, I mean, I, I, you've told me the story in the past, but uh, so these are very well-known companies, the the, uh, the folks that you tapped into, um, you know, experience and knowledge from these lawyers that you worked with. So this is in mobility and. Um, uh, access to, to food, right? So this is uh, groups that people know. And I, it's fascinating to, um, to see how um, outside of the healthcare industry, there are models that are uh, forcing our industry um, to, to adopt and to change and, and um, be successful with. So it's, it's pretty cool. Um, and, and Laura, do you have anything to, um, to, to kind of add to the yeah, I think there were both, you know, great points made by both. And and honestly, so, you know, Jabel is a huge enterprise. And so we've really taken the, you know, entrepreneurial approach in, inside of the monster. Um, and we've had phenomenal partnership with Microsoft. Um, you know, honestly, I, I think there's important things to do in, in how you approach problem solving. Um, you know, really took an agnostic approach, a very like build this flexible foundation that could be very quickly customized, low code, no code. But um, I think it's just so key to take that ethnographic approach, really understand, you know, what are those existing workflows in healthcare? Because they're going to run parallel to whatever is already in place next to the new solution to just kind of back that up until it is proven out. So if you don't want to be you know, changing that workflow on them. You need to make sure also, I see so many solutions come out that just provide more data. You know, unless you're providing an actionable insight instead of more data, that's that's going to be something that's not helpful. Um, but what I am seeing a really big focus on, um, particularly with the entry of open AI, is the privacy and security. You know, you're seeing it in things like just even, you know, commercial goods like Roomba, um, and I think as I start to see a lot of these medical device solutions start trickling down um, into more like athletic performance solutions, right? And so you might be using blood glucose monitoring solution for one, one way, but it's also starting to trickle down into these consumer facing things. How can I improve my athletic performance? Um, and you're just seeing so many different areas implement different security and privacy rules. I think it's so key to take an umbrella approach when it comes to that. Um, you know, we've opted to go the route of the high trust common security framework, and, and that's inclusive of, takes an umbrella approach, right? Inclusive of HIPAA, ISO 27001, like NIST, COBIT, uh, GDPR, and it's really taking this overarching approach um, to ensure that your architecture is built in a robust way, that you have the right security products and that you're building in the right policies and procedures. And I, I don't see, you know, another way to deal with all these different regulations in other areas other than this, this more of an umbrella approach to help kind of create that ecosystem. Yeah, I'm just picking up on something that you said about, you know, you are really putting a lot of good effort and communication into the privacy and security and all the different care that you adopt in your, you know, infrastructure. Communicating this with the partners and customers that you work with, I think, is helping to make people feel more comfortable in these things. So cloud, you know, five years ago was really not in the same place that with healthcare IT that it is today. There's so many, there's a lot more openness and trust, I think, coming with, especially if you have made trusted relationships with your customers, like Philips has a lot of key big customers that we that work with and have trust in our procedure and in, in our process. And so, yes, so that helps open up these possibilities and you can't have adoption of digital solutions until you have connectivity and until you have a lot of these things in place. And another thing I want to say is you're so right also about that, you know, just data and dashboards are not 
kind of answering the end question that people are really looking for. And especially, I think, in health, that's even more of the point where just a single data point doesn't give you a lot of rich data, you know, like a blood sugar level is just one data point, but then put it in some more context and then you have more insight and then, you know, coupled with the, the patient history or imaging, you know, if in layering these different types of information on top of each other, you really get into beyond insights into knowledge. And Philips also, big Philips, we are a lot of different things. <laughs> and we have kind of this, what's called health suite digital platform that helps do some of these things within Philips, connecting data from different care points and helps enable interoperability across the hospital and help with those big challenges and problems of trying to actually get meaningful insights for like the integrated care, the proactive and precise insights that people need to make decisions. Yeah, no, I, I think, you know, making it more tangible, you know, really people, if it's, if it's something that is IT, right, or it's regulatory, if you're somebody who is especially for somebody in med device, typically, right? They're very mechanical, very hands-on. What can I touch? So being able to put these in terms that are tangible and understandable, you know, really understanding how those things break down, I think helps significantly. I saw a lot of discussion in previous years um, with our larger blue chip companies, really trying to decide whether or not they wanted to own their own platform. And I'm starting to see, you know, you, you see the basic, um, a lot of like the orthopedic companies, right? You have a lot of building around um, robotic surgery or educating the patient or educating the surgeon, but there's a lot of gaps in between that can really add a lot of value. And I'm starting to see a lot of, you know, looking for entrepreneurial partnerships. And I think they're starting to become this understanding of, right? Like if I want to have a phone, for example, like I don't need to own Verizon, to operate it, right? To, to gain value from that. Um, so, uh, you know, being able to provide those resources for these larger companies, I think are, they're starting to realize they don't have to have this massive central, you know, data repository and platform. And I, if I may, I'm gonna break in real quick. We've got some good questions um, already lined up. Um, please keep adding them to the Q&A window um, as they come to your mind and we'll, we'll save some time at the back end. Yeah, um, can I can I yeah, add a couple? Please, Alan, go ahead. Yeah, so with respect to what Laura and Anna said, so the interesting thing is uh, both of them mentioned the words trust multiple times. And when we were actually building out our platform from a services perspective, uh, we had to look at this from trust as well. And so we, we started looking at what services can we originally offer up front that require a low degree of trust. They tended to be lifestyle and wellness activities, people taking yoga classes, stretching classes and stuff like that, low level of trust. And as you go across the line of trust, you see when you start getting into companion care, when people are meeting with you face to face, they're going up for walks, has a higher degree of trust. The one thing we'll put onto our platform as well is actually hands-on care. That actually has the highest level of trust. So what I'd encourage people when you're you know, looking at things like this, start out things that require a low level of trust and from a product roadmap perspective, face things in over time. So people are going like, yeah, I'm actually using CareMates. I got it. They're offering this now. I'm comfortable with it. I'll do it. The other thing is, Anna mentioned uh, data. Um, mm -hmm. And the reality is, rightfully or wrongfully, we call people data scientists. And uh, they just tend to produce data. And when you build stuff out, you need to look at an information architecture. It's just like, what is the outcome or the decision that people need to make to move forward? Because when you're just building dashboards that just have a bunch of stuff in it, it's stuff. And as executives, they look at this and they're going like, I don't want to know how the clock works. I'm asking you what time it is, right? And too many times, data scientists will tell you how the inyards of a watch works. And when you're an executive, you don't want to know that stuff. You want to know what time it is. That's what you're after. And yeah. so that's what I always tell these guys I work, work with, I say, it's information architecture, understand the inputs required to get to that outcome. And I think part, part of it is it's um, you got a lot of young, bright, really smart people coming out of university, but they haven't run lines of businesses or P&Ls. And they're just going like, well, this is pretty cool. But what they need to be doing is sitting down with, you know, people who are running stuff and saying, 
I'm putting this together. Do you really need this? Or am I just putting this together? Those are two yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's as all of us have to face, right? And and yeah. well, is the, the patients and the caregivers are at the center of, yeah. of anything that you do. So yeah, I mean, let's riff on that as well because it's critically important for um, making the right technologies uh, or products and and getting those products on the market and being successful. So yeah. any thoughts there? Yeah, yeah well, if you don't start with, you know the people who are using the the products, you're not going to make products that they want to make. And so, I mean, that they want to use, you're the one making it and they're the ones using it. So you go to the customer, you go to the patient, you really understand the context. I do think that Philips is, it lives, it, it, it aims to be customer first, patient first. And I do think that we really do live up to that of going out and really understanding deeply needs and context and the environment that those things are happening in. And that, yeah, I think. Well, Anna, so you, your team is putting, uh, aims to put ultrasound technology into the home. Um, that's a complicated stuff. Actually, I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I will say that today, ultrasounds are not in right. most homes, although yes. in the developing world, that is a little bit different because most, let's say, births are not attended to by doctors, but indeed, actually, midwives in the home actually are where people are using our Lumify ultrasounds. That's true. But um, I do think in the U.S. and in the Western world that someday mm -hmm. ultrasound really will be in the home or in small devices. And I do think that technology at that time will, you know, I don't think it's a limit of technology that artificial intelligence will be able to help guide, you know, us to use the probe and to make images and even to do some sorts of interpretation. But we are not there yet for ultrasound, especially outside of the developing world. It really still is in a medical context. But um, other Philips offerings definitely have gone to home. So like remote patient monitoring, we have uh, BioTel Care solution that helps and uses devices at home. And I'm not the most expert about those things, but actually I will say just as a person in, I've been, I've I have three kids and in one of my children, I was pregnant during the pandemic and a doctor, and you have to go to the doctor so many times for people who know who have been pregnant, especially if you're high risk, you have to go to the doctor all the time. And they had an idea like, oh, okay, why don't you, because some of the time it's not even for imaging, it's for just check your blood pressure and check other pieces of information like that. So they said, oh, let's write your prescription for a blood blood pressure cuff and we can do a remote session for that. And the experience of that was so not smooth. It was like a, hmm. a durable medical equipment provider had to call me on the telephone and like I missed the call and back and forth. And I was like, this is ridiculous. I just bought one for myself. But, you know, these, that, that end to end experience flow really needs to be sorted out a little better. And, you know, again, just that's a thing about how we're not there yet, but uh, I do really believe that we will be there eventually. And, you know, the ultrasound of the future that your doctor prescribes and writes, sticks it in a bag and you get it, you know, you use it during your pregnancy and then you throw it back in the bag and get it picked up and that data yeah. can be transmitted, but that's not on our commercial roadmap, not something I'm promising, but I do see that happening in the future for sure. But there, there's so many drivers that are pushing us in that direction, right? You think about, we talked a little bit about, or maybe it was Laura who mentioned it, caregiver burnout, staff shortages, um, uh, high costs, uh, difficulty getting in a pandemic, it's hard to get to the clinic and that kind of thing. Um, and so these are all, uh, reasons that we need to be thinking hard about this this kind of thing, and that patients are taking their health care into their own hands and managing uh, their health care if, if they're going to uh, get well. Um, and so digital um, strategies should uh, facilitate that, um, or, you know, that's my hope anyway, that, that this is the uh, one of the pillars that we're going to be building off of to allow patients to control their health and well-being uh, more so than they use today. Um, Laura, you, you seem like you have some comments. 
Yeah, no, I, again, I think it just, it goes back to really understanding where is that value, right? And, and how can you take the existing workflows and really simplify those and streamline those? Um, so, I mean, to the point where I would have customers coming in asking for a, a solution and they might've taken like an acquisition approach and they're looking to unify those or, or add a um, connected element to say like an app or some monitoring. And I got to the point where, I'd ask, you know, well, what, what is your intent here? What is the problem that you're trying to solve? What are the decisions that need to be actioned on? And, and where are the difficulties in those workflows? And it really came down to requiring, I mean, it got to the point where I required my team and actually my customers to undergo a, a short um, series of stakeholder interviews with C-suite development, really understanding, you know, what did they need from a business perspective? Did they understand the value that they were providing? And then work with clinicians and patients as well to really understand through ethnographic research, what's the right kind of connectivity? Like how savvy are your users going to be? Um, and, and what kind of value were they going to gain? Like what problems did they really want to solve? You know, for example, just working on a, a diabetes program and, you know, working with older adults and you're thinking, hey, this is a group that really oftentimes doesn't really understand how to use even a smartphone, right? So really understanding what's the right con connectivity. And it was really inspiring to see like some of them were um, like Freestyle Libre customers um, or users. And it was just really encouraging to see how excited that they got. Um, you know, hey, this isn't something I would have monitored if I had to do all these things at home. But now, even when I'm out with my friends, because it's so easy, like I'm keeping tabs on this. And because of this, you know, my, I'm making these little changes. I'm understanding what my actions impact have on my health now that I didn't understand before. And this mm -hmm. is allowing me to make some significant changes. So that's, that's been really, um, I think something to focus on in my mind, again, I'm coming from that usability perspective, but it, it's so impactful if you can really understand what they're trying to solve. So the, you know, blue chip customer had come in saying, oh, well, we just want it to be X and connected. And they didn't understand what their patients were looking for, or even the, the clinicians and how frustrated they were yeah. with the problems uploading data. You know, so just all those things, whether it's the connectivity the interoperability or just, you know, what value are you actually delivering? And I think it was really eye-opening in particular for that, that one customer to see the output of that. Yeah, that's neat. And if I, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and change gears real quick here. I, um, one of the things that we discussed in, in pre preparation for this was there's a really interesting dynamic between large established companies right now and startups in terms of their digital strategies or their plans for such. And so every single startup early stage company that we see has a full on well thought out digital strategy. But for the large established companies that we work with, I'm going to sit down with them and ask them about what is their strategy. I'm most often faced with, with blank stares. Um, everything that's on market for a lot of these companies, there is no strategy for digital. And anything that's three, three years from the factory or from the market is already too late to implement something on. Um, and so then it's, you know, these big companies are looking uh, three or five years out and they don't really have much of a, a concept of it. So I've got two folks here, one from a very large company, uh, Philips, and one from a, a early stage company, CareMates. Um, maybe talk a little bit about that dynamic and, and the hope that uh, innovative companies may um, be, one of the solutions that we have to this, this big problem. Yeah, I don't know if you want to go first. Well, I'll just say that I think building on what we said before about, you know, really meeting people where they are is a, and it, Phillips has a proud history of innovation. You know, we're 130 years old. And I think we've really come, every employee has come away with the idea that you must innovate to be the real world is that it is digital and getting more and more digital and people want these experiences that they have already and how they buy and how they, you know, travel and how they work and how they play. And so they want that from healthcare too. So I think it's just kind of a survival thing, but also I was going to say also another element really of that innovation focus is that we do, if you look really closely at Philips, there are a lot of small startups 
that have been acquired and are now part of our businesses too. So I think that kind of can also help, you know, splice in some agility mm -hmm. to the big uh, conglomerates. So those two things I just want to sneak yeah. in there. First. You know, it, it's interesting because when you look at it, innovation, um, you know, you can look at it, what they call horizon one, horizon two, horizon three. And when you get into horizon three, it's very disruptive innovation. Horizon one tends to be incremental. And the reality is when you work in a big company, um, a lot of them tend to focus on horizon one innovation. And, and why is that is because they have a lot of customers, they're making a lot of money and they have these focus groups with these customers and these customers come in and say, hey, this is a problem for me. And they go like, we'll fix that problem for you. And they'll get incremental revenue off it. But when you're a startup like us, we looked at this whole thing and we got we got like a clean white slate. It's like, how are you going to completely reinvent this? And so we can get into H3 innovation. It's just like we could take all these technologies. Um, we could use open APIs. We could build a very different technology stack and you could do it quickly. And so we're we're not encumbered by a business model. And if you're publicly traded, I mean, rightfully or wrongfully, the CFO is being on top of the CEO and saying, hey, you got to meet these numbers. If you're spending this kind of money here, you're not going to do it. Focus on this stuff. And that's just, that's just the nature of the beast. Why, you know, let's go back and talk about open API. I mean, their numbers came out recently. They're burning through a lot of money right now. I mean, if Microsoft was doing that on a, you know, quarterly earnings call, I mean, the CEO, someone would put up their hand and go like, hey, you just burned through $100, $100 billion. What are you doing, right? When you're a startup, you can go out and you can raise that money. You don't have, you know, regular earnings calls to, to, to deal with all that stuff. So there's, you know, you could, you could do this, you know, Horizon 3 innovation. I mean, you look at, you know, Uber, Airbnb, Lyft, all the other stuff that, you know, you've seen come out of here, they, they didn't have the business model uh, of, you know, the taxi companies. They didn't have the business model of the hospitality industry. It's like, we're going to reinvent this. And then part of it was like, well, who's going to, you know, go into someone's house and, um, you know, people are just going like, Hey, look, I'm on vacation. My house is empty. I can make some cash on the side. I'm going to rent it out. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. A, a different way of looking at problems and thinking about things. So. Yeah, you made me think of, you know, you go to customers and they're asking for a faster horse. They're not asking about a car. Yeah, well, but uh, I mean, it, you know, open AI is a good, good indication of that. And you look at the difference between Tesla and Toyota right now. I mean, Tesla did 100% focus on EV. Toyota had hybrid, right? And, you know, you look at where the EV market's going now, there's different car companies in there running this thing, right? So they weren't encumbered by traditional, you know, business models, a bunch of infrastructure and stuff like that. So, yeah, fascinating. Well, um, I'm keeping an eye on time here. Um, I want to get at least one question or so uh, from the from the audience. And and Mark has a couple of questions, good ones around uh, something we haven't quite touched on too much um, is payers in the insurance industry. Um, uh, and, and maybe this goes to you, Alan, um, with your experience in, in building a business model around getting someone to pay for it. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I'll talk both about Japan and the U.S. So if you take a look at long-term care insurance in Japan for older the adults, it's 100% government funded. And so the first question I got, well, who's going to pay for this? Who's going to pay for this when it started coming to companion care? So there's always this um, hypothesis out there that no one would pay for this. So but when we actually started doing pilots, we found out that there's enough people willing to pay for this because they didn't want to deal with the rigmarole of getting reimbursed and everything. So that's piece number one. Interestingly enough, when you go into the US, um, so in Japan, when you actually get care, you go see a care manager. This person will put together a plan, give you points. That really doesn't exist in the US. But what we found out by doing market research in the state of California, in certain neighborhoods down in LA and in San Francisco, there's people who are affluent enough who are willing to pay $130 an hour to have someone put together a care plan for their parents. So we, we came across that. And there's people, you know, when you start poking around running businesses who are putting together care plans for older adults. So at the same time, some of the work we're doing within the states, it's like, well, you need to go into the traditional payers and get reimbursed from it because it goes back to who pays. So you just got to figure out how to segment your market. That's part of it is understanding what's going to 
you know, what's going to move you quick. And when you're dealing with an individual, uh, that's going to move you quick. If they have money, they're going to pay for it. Once you start dealing with a large insurance company, your sales cycle is six months plus. So mm -hmm. you just need to be prepared to deal with six, 12, 18 month sales cycles if you get in a move. Yeah. Well, and, oh, go ahead, Anna, please. Uh, yeah. I just wanted to say that also, though, you know, thinking about getting payers to move and for biotel care, remote patient monitoring, you know, since 2018. Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services have been providing some reimbursement for remote patient monitoring service. And I've, you know, I've heard, again, I'm not like the, the expert, but these policies are expanding over time to offer a little more flexibility, a little more coverage. And I think the way is kind of like Philip says, done with not just remote monitoring, but everything is you provide regulatory bodies with compelling clinical data, not just about patient safety, of course, about patient safety, but also about meaningful measurable patient outcomes, you know, so, and then these policies can evolve and then, of course, influence coverage and payment models for everybody else, so. Well, I mean, looking at it from the other side, have... oh. go ahead, sorry. Now, looking at it from the other side, too, I mean, so we do have these codes that have been released, right, and they they provide opportunity to really be able to monetize some of the, you know, gaps that they're saying right now. They don't, like if you look at, for example, post-surgical monitoring, you, know, you used to be able to leave the hospital and somebody would call and follow up, and then you could have somebody come to the home and, and you know, provide some care if that was needed. If you look at the resource shortage right now, there's so many gaps in being able to do that patient monitoring and, you know, a, a lack of ability to really make any money. So I'm, you're starting to see this tipping point in healthcare where, Again, they just, there's not enough income and there's so many patients. So one of the solutions to be able to provide and monetize off of those codes that exist for post uh, or for, um, you know, monitoring outside of the home or therapeutics outside of the home, that if you're not providing that solution in a way that connects with the payers, and they're really, you know, the gatekeeper along with healthcare, they're, you're enabling them to, you know, actually make money. And, and provide value that they haven't been able to because of those resource gaps. So, you know, looking at from that side as well, making sure you're designing for those codes. Yeah, I think the other thing you'll probably start seeing this in the U.S. And they, I mean, Japan's demographics went upside down about 12 years ago, right? So they're they're at the forefront of this whole thing. It's prevalent in Japan now. All the big insurance companies offer dementia care insurance, right? Dementia insurance nursing care insurance, which we got the equivalent of long-term care over here. But as the population ages in the U.S., insurance company going to sit back and they're like, wow, we got to do something about this, right? So you go back in Japan like nine years ago, you wouldn't see dementia insurance. All the big life insurance companies over there carry it now. They all carry nursing care insurance. The market forced them to go that way. The demographics did. So, yeah. All right. Well, so again, mindful of time, I wanted to wrap up with uh, give people a couple of minutes to get to their next Zoom meetings. Um, but um, thanks again to you guys, maybe just like 30 seconds each on the, the promise or what makes you guys excited um, uh, for the next five years or so uh, with digital adoption and, and helping patients to, to gain more control over their health care. Um, starting with you, Laura. I mean, honestly, I think it's just exciting to be able to move from a device endpoint, just giving you some information or the focus you used to see in diagnostics, right, of, of how do we properly balance this, this machine and calibrate that. And there was all this mournfulness of like, oh, people aren't as skilled at, at doing this anymore. But the reality is it's not so much about you know, running the device or running the machine. It's what kind of information are we being able to take away to really move the needle, whether it's for patients or, you know, even with a device, right? How can, how can I help you innovate that next level? Um, you know, have customers come in and say, oh, can you take this data and, and put it somewhere that I can give it to my data scientists later? And I said, well, you know, why don't we provide you a dashboard that you can really understand the historic use? And, and then your R&D group can actually use that to innovate. So that to me is, is really exciting to be able to just make things more accessible, I think, and, and see that ability to affect change. Yeah, yeah, fun. Uh, Anna? Yeah, I think one of the exciting things is a little bit 
uh, sad, but it's that it, there really is so much pressure on healthcare organizations and the stats, like one in five healthcare providers have left since 2020 and that the International Nurses Association, Geneva-based coalition of nurses say by 2030, there could be a shortage of like 13 million nurses, I believe. And so even though, like Laura said, okay, you know, we, I think AI and having a lot of like very wonderful insights about meaning and all these things are super, super, super important, but the people really do make a difference too. I don't think that we're going to be able to have excellent patient experience and care when we have staff shortages like we're seeing today. But I do think that AI also can help in there with like being able to do kind of more of the insane administrative manual tasks that people have to do and kind of automating and speeding up parts of the exams and things. So I think there's a lot of opportunity that's where I'm excited about. Yeah, exactly. With any, really with any great crisis, there's plenty of opportunities. And, and Alan, what are your final thoughts? Yeah, I mean, you know, every day people grow a day older. So, I mean, you know, what our, our mission is to make sure people could remain healthy, happy, and, you know, age with dignity. So we're, we're actually, we're going to, you know, reimagine how people age. That's what we're here to do. So Super. Well, thank you uh, to all three of you. Anna King, um, I'll, I'll send it back to you. Um, thanks for everybody in the audience um, and for my panel. Um, this was a fascinating conversation. I hope it was uh, fruitful for everyone else too. So Anna, please. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. And thank you to our panelists and the Triple Ring Technologies team for such a valuable presentation. Uh, we cannot put on great and educational content like this without your support. So thank you. And to learn more about MassMedic and our events coming up, check us out on social media or visit our website at massmedic.com. But thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful day. Yeah. Have thank a great you. day from California. Take care. Right. Yep. Bye, Bye, everyone.